I was sitting in the ER when Candy barreled through the doors and ran over to the reception desk. After arguing with the admitting nurse for 15 minutes, they finally let her in. I mindlessly scanned my Twitter feed while I waited. I smiled when Dee Dee's most recent tweet popped up. I was still smiling when Candy came out and spotted me in the waiting room. I stood up as she stormed over to me. What the fuck, Ryan? He's got two broken legs. You were supposed to keep this from happening. She stared at me, her lower lip trembling with rage. The smile faded from my face. I was supposed to keep him alive. He's alive. She slapped my face so hard, I nearly dropped my phone. steps of the small building on the east side of Manhattan, cursing the asshole who allowed the construction of any buildings in New York City without elevators. The door to apartment 412 was open when I got there. Candy? I called through the open door. Candy poked her head into view and frantically waved me into the apartment. I walked into the living room. You looking for new apartments? This is my friend Charlie's place. We were supposed to meet for breakfast this morning, but he left me a message canceling. I came here to check on him and the door was open. He didn't show up at work either. You have to find him. Okay, take a breath. When was the last time you actually spoke to him? Last night. That's not very long. He might have cruised the local bars and ended up crashed on a friend's couch. Or decided to just get out of the city for a while. The only place he's ever crashed is my apartment, and I don't think he'd take off without his cell phone. Candy pointed behind me to the island that separated the minuscule kitchen from the living room. The phone sat between a picture of a middle-aged couple and a neatly folded sweater. The sweater was made of high-quality wool and the weave was slightly uneven. This wasn't a mass-produced item. It was the kind of thing a mother knits for her son. The island countertop also had a patch that was bubbled and slightly browned, as though a pot had been accidentally placed on the formica. The burn was an odd shape, though. I plucked the phone off the table and checked out the rest of the apartment while I talked to Candy. There wasn't much to see. A kitchen, a bed made up with hospital corners tucked into an alcove, and a small room that could only pass for a living room in New York City. In the bathroom was an empty litter box. Where's the cat? He asked me to take care of it a couple of weeks ago. He said he wasn't home enough because of work and it wasn't fair to her. Also something you would do if you wanted to get out of town for a while. The TV and the computer are here and the apartment is immaculate, so it wasn't a burglary. Actually, that's another reason I'm worried. This place is usually a mess. You think he was carried off by a band of Swiffer-wielding street thugs? He's a troubled guy, Ryan. He's been in the hospital three times in the last ten years. Depression. I'm worried he might try and kill himself. Has he ever tried before? About a year ago, I dropped in on him one night after work. I knocked for ten minutes before he let me in. He had a bottle of Vicodin and a pint of vodka on the kitchen table. I took him straight to the ER. Was that the only time? There was a fire in his apartment a few years ago. He swore up and down that it was an accident, but... I glanced again at the scorch mark on the kitchen counter. I walked into the living room, over to the wall with a dozen different pictures on it. Nearly all of them were of the same young man in his mid to late twenties with different people. Is this him? I asked as I looked over the pictures. Candy nodded. She was right about one thing. Charlie was miserable. He wore the same hollow, mildly amused expression in each picture. The picture frames were arranged in an elegant pattern, but there were several spots that were conspicuously empty. Did he break up with someone recently? No. Well, more than a year ago. 
That fits. What do you mean? It's long enough to get over his ex, but recent enough that he hasn't replaced her pictures. I said, pointing at the blank spots on the wall. Was it a bad breakup? Do any of them go well? Was it you? No, Candy said, wearing the look of a child who just got caught peeking at her Christmas presents. No, I thought. But you're in love with him, aren't you? I glanced around the space again. Some of the floorboards in the living room had been replaced. The edges of the old boards were darkened, possibly singed. Where in the apartment was the fire? It started in the bathroom, I think. It was a small fire, but it made a hell of a mess. Kitchen, bathroom, living room all have fire damage. If those were suicide attempts, there are easier ways. I think you have a secret, Charlie. Can you find him? I'll try. I'm going to have a look around. I'll call you when I have something. I gave her a hug, tucked Charlie's phone into my pocket, and walked out the door. Charlie had the courtesy to leave his phone unlocked, but the only numbers in his contacts belonged to Candy, the ex-girlfriend, and a bunch of neighborhood restaurants that delivered. Candy was too upset to be of any real help. The ex hung up on me at the mention of Charlie's name. And no one at the restaurants had seen him in at least a week. Though I did find a really good ramen place. When the streets hadn't provided me any answers, I went back home to do some research online. I chewed over every morsel of information about Charlie until the flavor had gone out of it, then moved on to the next one. Charlie's calendar, his social media accounts, and text messages. Nothing but gristle. The burns in his apartment were the most interesting detail I had about him. If I was right about what caused them, then Charlie could be in more danger than Candy realizes. And the sooner I found him, the better. I sat for so long racking my brain about what to do next that the computer put itself to sleep. I was staring at my own reflection in the monitor when the phone rang. I picked it up without looking at the caller ID. Did you call her? Hello, Samantha. Yes, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. Did you call her? What's her name again? Her name is Dee Dee, and yes, as a matter of fact, I did call her. Good boy. First date? It was supposed to be tonight, but I'm probably going to have to cancel. I'm on a job. It'll wait a couple of hours while you have dinner. This one's important. I can't just put it on the shelf while I go on a date. Actually, that's exactly what going on a date is. You put your bullshit on hold and focus on someone else for a while. Not this one. The more I dig into it, the more I think this guy's in real trouble. He may already be dead. And if you skip dinner and sit there in your apartment torturing yourself, he will somehow be less dead when you find him? Jesus Christ. And people say I'm cold? If you had a shred of information to go on, you'd be out there running this guy down. You're too close to it. You don't even know what we're talking about. I know you. Your head disappears up your own ass while you're working. Have you eaten today? Did you even remember to take off your coat when you got back to your place? I looked at the haggard reflection in the dark screen of my computer in front of me. Fuck you. Exactly. Put on a pair of decent shoes and go buy this woman a steak. Actually, we're meeting at Gran Ticino. Feel piccata, then. Smile when you see her, compliment her earrings, and chew your food with your mouth closed. You are unbelievable. Have a good time, babe. She hung up before I could respond. I sat there for a few more minutes stewing over the fact that she was right. Then I took a shower, dug my dress shoes out of the closet, and headed downtown to meet Dee Dee. By 7.30, I was standing outside the Grand Ticino trying to push Charlie, Candy, and Samantha into a corner of my mind where they wouldn't bother me for a couple of hours. Three deep breaths later, they were still nagging at me from different angles. 
I couldn't fit another thing into my head tonight. I thought about leaving and sending Dee Dee a text, apologizing for standing her up. But that was a real dick move, even for me. Especially since I was already there. I went in and looked around the small restaurant for Dee Dee. Were it not for her blue and green hair, I wouldn't have recognized her. She sat at a table reading from her iPad. The sleeves of her silk blouse came down to her wrists covering her tattoos. Black jeans hugged her hips. The heels of her black leather boots were wrapped in chrome that matched her belt buckle. I walked over to the table, taking in the transformation in her appearance. Hi, I said, sitting down. My mouth hung open slightly in a half-formed grin as I continued to stare at her. I scrub up well, don't I? She said with a smile. Sorry, I said awkwardly and studied the menu. You were expecting me to show up wearing a dog collar and Doc Martens, weren't you? You were wearing Doc Martens when I first met you. Mm-hmm. I started to apologize, but she raised her hand. It was worth it to see the look on your face when you walked in. I remembered Samantha's advice and glanced at the dime-sized plugs in Dee Dee's earlobes. I decided complimenting them was probably a mistake. Were you waiting long? I said as I looked back down at my menu. I was early. I had a job interview in the area. The waiter arrived and I ordered a glass of Pinot Grigio. Make that a bottle. When the waiter left, she tucked her iPad into her bag. What were you reading? An article on Kotaku about the new Destiny DLC. Is that the story you tweeted about today? You following me on Twitter? Yes. Didn't learn anything about you, though. It's all game achievements and retweets. I guess you'll have to just talk to me, then, she said with a disarming smile. I took to intensely studying the candle in the middle of the table while rooting around in the garbage in my head for something to say. The waiter returned with the wine and filled our glasses. So where was your interview? Another multinational corporation? No, a dog owner. I looked up at her. I'm sorry? Before I got the job at Marshall Technologies, I was a dog walker. Is there a lot of money in that? Yes, actually. Not as good as being a database jockey, but the dogs are happier to see me when I show up for work. So you're rethinking your corporate career path? No, but I've got to pay the rent. It's dog walking or change my name to Plum and shake my ass from a stripper pole. We're ten minutes into dinner and you're already swinging from a pole? Are you sure the wine is a good idea? You need the wine more than I do, she said as she clinked her glass with mine. So, you said you've been here for less than a year. What made you come to New York? It was next. You're supposed to be better at this than me. That's all you got? I left Leavenworth when I was 18 for college. Worked in Chicago for a couple of years after graduation and got married. Then I followed my husband to Indianapolis when he changed jobs. I pissed away a year and a half before I realized what a lying bastard he was and, on the advice of my divorce attorney, moved to Philadelphia. Dee Dee's voice was like the vague warmth a lover leaves behind when she leaves your bed in the morning. Comforting, yet seductive. I became so wrapped up in it that I barely noticed when the waiter brought our food. How long had it been since I just listened to someone? Not dissecting their story in search of contradictions or ulterior motives. Too long for me to remember. She had lived in half the cities in the Midwest in the last ten years. I'm 31 and I can count on one hand the number of times I've been outside New York State. A small part of me wondered how long she planned to hang around. Eventually, I decided it would be nice to live somewhere by choice rather than as an escape plan. New York was next. Disappointed? Dee Dee shook her head as she took a sip of her wine. It's not as bad as I made it out to be the last time I saw you. I was in the middle of a rough patch. So what about you? What about me? You've got to have a story beyond being the baseball card repo man. I gave her a half smile. 
are you really a photographer? Among other things. When I didn't volunteer more, she picked up the bottle of wine and filled my glass nearly to the brim. I drained half the glass in a rather unsophisticated gulp. I've got a good eye and a knack for sizing up situations. It makes me good at taking pictures, finding things, solving problems. I'm a photographer because I love it. I do other jobs because I can. And they pay better. I've known a few photographers who do pretty well. Based on what you know about me, do you think I'd be happy photoshopping snot out of baby portraits for a living? She smiled and shook her head. So your job is solving problems? Basically. Mm-hmm. And do you have a problem you're working on right now? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if the goodnight kiss will be a polite goodbye or an invitation for another date. You see, the wine is helping. I felt a rush of heat to my face. She continued to look at me. That's not what you were thinking about. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. Oh, come on, who am I going to tell? Maybe it was the comforting smile her mouth seemed to naturally settle into, or the way her blouse hugged her breasts, or the wine. But before I knew it, I was talking about Charlie's disappearance. I maintained enough composure to skirt most of the specific details, though. The person who hired me thinks he's suicidal. I'm not sure what I think yet. Usually I can break things down quickly. This one's just annoying. You said his apartment was clean. Was he a neat freak before he disappeared? From what I understand, no. Did he give anything away recently? Anything important? I thought of the empty litter box in the apartment and nodded my head. Anything in the apartment deliberately left out for people to find? There was no note if that's what you're asking. She shook her head. Things left somewhere people would notice because they're out of place, not just tossed on the floor. Carefully arranged, his cell phone and a few things were on the kitchen counter. Your friend's right, he's going to kill himself. I stared at her, wanting to ask how she knew all this, but not sure I wanted to hear the answer. This isn't my first rodeo. People who kill themselves try to make it easier on the people they leave behind. Like that's possible she said, shaking her head. They also tend to stick close to home when they try it. I wouldn't go running all over the city looking for him. He's going to pick a place that's familiar. I nodded. We smiled at each other in the awkward way you do when a conversation has turned up a patch of rough road and there's no way to back out of it. We talked about her work and avoided any more discussion of mine. Honestly, I don't remember what I said. My thoughts are jumbled up in a way they hadn't been in a long time. I must have managed because she seemed content with the conversation. Interested, even. We finished our coffee and we were both surprised to find it was after 10 p.m. I walked her to her subway stop. This turned out better than I expected, she said as she slipped her arm around mine, leaning against me as we walked. I could feel her breast against my arm. We got to the end train station, and she slipped her arms around my neck. Thank you for dinner. Her lips were grazing mine as she said it. Then she kissed me. A lingering kiss that pushed all the noise out of my head for the second time that night. When the kiss finally faded, she leaned her forehead against mine. Did that seem like a polite goodbye to you? I shook my head. She smiled. So you call me? I nodded. She gave me a quick peck on the lips, slipped out of my arms, and descended the stairs to the subway platform. I watched her until she passed out of sight, then walked up the street toward my train. My mind wandered back through the evening like a goofy kid repeating all the dialogue from his favorite movie. Eventually, it worked its way around to our discussion about Charlie and how people who attempt suicide usually stay close to home. I stopped dead in my tracks as I remembered the one obvious place I'd forgotten to check when I was searching for Charlie. I'm such an idiot.
I jumped the train uptown, and 45 minutes later, I was at Charlie's building. I pressed all the call buttons until somebody buzzed me in. I took the stairs two at a time, and at the top of the building, I burst out onto the roof. Charlie was standing at the edge of the roof, looking down over the four-foot wall that bordered the top of the building. He was bare from the waist up, with his arms folded across his chest, completely unaffected by the cold. This piece of information settled right next to the memory of the scorch mark on Charlie's kitchen counter and the singes on the floorboards. Charlie, do I know you? Candy asked me to find you. She was afraid something had happened to you. Well, you can tell her not to worry about me. He let his hands drop onto the ledge in front of him. My hand dove into my pocket and found my phone, but as I was pulling it out, I realized if he saw what I was doing, he might jump before I could even dial 911. He was muscular and had at least 50 pounds on me. Wrestling him to the ground wasn't an option. Lugging his ass down the stairs while holding time still wasn't likely either. I had to talk him down. I'm no good at this shit. I should have called Candy and let her handle him. You can go, Charlie said. Go. Tell her I'm fine. I really think you should tell her yourself. No response. Candy tells me you two are close. He gave a barely perceptible nod. Then you know if she finds out that we were up here together and I let something happen to you, she'll kick my ass from here to Jersey City. The corner of his mouth flickered toward a smile, then returned to a morbid line across his face. This isn't working. Get his attention, Ryan. Okay, let's try it this way. I saw the burns in your apartment. I know about the fire. Charlie's head turned toward me. His clean-shaven, handsome face was a twisted mess of anger and hopelessness. So for you, it's heat. His eyes narrowed. You can control heat, yes? The mix of apprehension and relief that comes when you know your secret's out washed over his face. He nodded. How does it work for you? Charlie hesitated, sizing me up, then closed his eyes and laid his hand against the metal conduit that came up out of the roof of the building. For a moment, it seemed like nothing was happening. Then the conduit slowly changed color from the gray of the metal to orange to bright cherry red. Weakened by the heat, the metal finally collapsed in on itself, and he pulled his hand away. You can't just create heat, right? It has to come from somewhere else? Charlie glanced down. His shoes and the roof under his feet were covered with frost. He must have siphoned the heat up from the floor below us. It started when you were in your teens? Charlie nodded again. And you didn't see it coming the first time. Maybe you hurt someone by accident? Not badly, just enough to scare the shit out of them. My high school girlfriend. The first time we had sex, she thought I gave her an STD. It was frostbite. I had been edging my way up to the wall as we talked. I looked down at the people passing under the corner streetlight on their way to somewhere warm. You know, every single person down there would probably jump at the chance to do what we do. They have no idea how lucky they are to be normal, ordinary. I look back to see him nodding slowly. You've been out here since yesterday morning? Yes. Why don't we talk about this in your apartment? You must be starving and I'm freezing my ass off up here. He gave me the most pathetic smile I'd ever seen. Then he took a step toward me. I moved back to give him room. But instead of walking to the door, he planted his hand on the wall, heaved himself up, and disappeared over the edge. I yanked time to a halt, like a weightlifter heaving an overloaded barbell over his head. Things came to an abrupt stop. Time needs to be treated with finesse. When you manhandle it, it pushes back. I was overcome with dizziness, and my dinner threatened to come back up. 
I grabbed the ledge to steady myself and took several deep breaths. Looking down, I saw Charlie frozen in the air, half a story down from the top of the building. Looking over the edge gave me vertigo. I rested my elbows on the ledge and dropped my head into my palms until the dizziness faded. Then I looked down again. You've put me in a hell of a spot, Charlie, I said, shaking my head. He was falling. The fact that time had stopped changed nothing. Even if I let out time slowly, he'd still pick up speed for every moment that he descended. By the time he reached the alley below, he'd hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. Fortunately, Charlie lived in a neighborhood that was old enough to still have fire escapes on the outside of the buildings, and he was courteous enough to jump close to one of them. I took a few deep breaths to steady myself, and I climbed down the fire escape until I was below Charlie. Then I let time out slowly, and as he descended, I grabbed Charlie and pulled him toward the fire escape until he was hovering next to me inside the metal structure. Then released time slowly back to normal. He hit the steel grate of the fire escape, cried out in pain, and slumped against the side of the building. I pulled out my phone and called 911 as I climbed the rest of the way down the fire escape, leaving him where he was. A few minutes later, a police cruiser pulled up at the scene. When the officers got out, I ran up to them. That guy, that guy was standing on the roof and he just jumped. Somehow he got caught in the fire escape. Stay here, sir, the officer said as he walked over to the fire escape. I didn't want my name on a police statement, so when he started to climb the fire escape, I slipped across the street and waited. I wandered back into earshot when the ambulance showed up and I heard someone say Charlie was bound for New York Presbyterian Hospital. I called Candy and told her where to meet me. I was sitting in the ER when she barreled through the doors and ran over to the reception desk. After arguing with the admitting nurse for 15 minutes, they finally let her in. I mindlessly scanned my Twitter feed while I waited. I smiled when Dee Dee's most recent tweet popped up. Achievement unlocked. Awesome first date. I was still smiling when Candy came out and spotted me in the waiting room. I stood up as she stormed over to me. What the fuck, Ryan? He's got two broken legs. You were supposed to stop this from happening. She stared at me, her lower lip trembling with rage. The smile faded from my face. I was supposed to find him and keep him alive. He's alive. She slapped my face so hard I nearly dropped my phone. You're welcome, I said as I turned to go. Candy put her hand on my chest to stop me. Her mouth was an angry line, but her eyes were apologetic. I put my arms around her, bracing myself for a slug to the gut. She collapsed against my chest and sobbed. When the sobs receded, I said, Candy, you really should tell him how you feel about him. Her body tensed for a moment, then she let out a breath. You're one to talk, she said as she thumped her fist on my chest. I'm working on it. If you've enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to rate The Redshift Chronicles on iTunes. The Redshift Chronicles is written and performed by Tom Simonson. The show is recorded by Steve Simonson at String Theory Studios. 